John Trevor coming to you from a car park in Norwich, UK. It's a bit cold and bleak cold and again. a bit cold again in Britain, typical, and a bit breezy. So um, we're coming to you from this car park where there is an ornamental pear tree which doesn't produce fruit. So we're going to open prayer and then Trevor's going to read from Matthew 21 verse 18. Matthew 21, 18 forwards. So let's just open in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for this new day. We thank you, Lord, you've given us another day to reach out with the truth in love, your gospel. So, Lord, we're going to just talk about this uh, tree, an ornamental pear tree. And so it's over to Trevor now for him to read that passage. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we're reading from Matthew... Matthew 21, starting 18. Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing except leaves. Then he said to it, yes, Jesus spoke to the fig tree. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly? They asked. <clears throat> Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to this fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. So what is the purpose of a fig tree if not to produce fruit? And of course Jesus was talking about this as a lesson for a literal lesson, but also a lesson about, if you like, religion of his day. It was all show and no fruit. No fruit of the Holy Spirit. The religion of his day. <laughs> Trevor. Yeah. He's humming away in the background. <laughs> I, can, I can see you there, Trevor. So um, here is an ornamental pear tree, which has lovely blossom, white blossom. But you can see, if you just look at their branches, you can see there's, there's nothing there. There's no fruit. All the blossom is gone. And it's just taking up the ground now, just looking green. OK, but oh, look, hang on. What's that over there? There's some fruit on that tree over there. And look. What's this? We've got some grapes hanging from the pear tree. A few weeks ago, I had this idea of putting some grapes on this pear tree. Let's just come around here. And you can see that this has made the tree more useful. And I've kept this up for a few weeks now. Some grapes hanging, they're on rubber bands and people come and take them. And they go after a while. And then I put more fruit on them. Let's see if I can get that in the background. So I put more fruit on the trees and um, it's a lesson for the world. And of course, they um, think it's a bit strange but if you like, it's an art project to bring back to usefulness a tree that technically is just ornamental, but no fruit. And of course, you know the spiritual lesson Jesus was teaching us about the purpose of a fruit tree is to bear fruit. Of course, it's not just the fig tree, it's the olive tree, it's the grape vine, it's all sorts of fruit trees are meant to have fruit because that is the purpose they've been made for to to bear fruit and good fruit so now we're talking about the church of today we're not just talking about the jewish nation 2000 years ago where jesus came to preach the truth the gospel the kingdom of heaven is near and Jesus explained with parables exactly what the kingdom of heaven was. Now I'm reminded of the grain of wheat that must fall into the ground and die in order to produce fruit. 30, 
60, 100 fold seeds come from one seed that dies. And of course, Jesus Christ himself had to die so that we could understand his teaching wasn't just a theoretical uh, 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 philosophy and ethos that we obey Christ's teaching and, and we do good and we do charity and we help the poor, we feed them, we clothe them. And all these things are good, good works. But of course, we're talking about faith and works. We're talking about salvation which leads to works of righteousness. And we're talking about Christ who's in us to do good and to do good things for people. And the Spirit of Christ in us today, he is wanting to help people through us, but it's faith and works, not the other way around. If it was works instead of faith then the Jehovah's Witnesses will be there first because of their works they go on the streets with their books and they give it away free and they talk about the Bible the New King James Bible which conceals their hidden Bible beneath the surface which is deception if it was good works the Mormons they'd get in because of their rituals and their sacraments and their goodness and their kindness and their goodness to each other and, and their love for each other. And if the Mormons got in, well, the Freemasons would get in because they are a huge charity that has hospitals and uh, orphanages and care homes for the widows of their Freemason members. And if, if charitable works could get people in, well, then Bill Gates would get in with his foundation. All these charitable people are doing good works, and that is the state of society today in 2023, that people think they're good enough to go to heaven. Brackets, if there is a heaven, they think they'll get in because of their goodness. And then it comes down to a religious denomination, which I don't particularly have to mention, you know what I'm talking about, where they benefactors pray the priest to pray for them so their time in purgatory is, is the shortest possible. Well, that's just nonsense. That's not biblical. That's not what Jesus said. So the evolution of Christianity has devolved ever since the Catholic denomination was invented by Constantine. And then, as you know, robber king Henry VIII stole the Catholic church buildings, did a takeover bid, and changed what was the Church of Rome in England to the Church of England in England. And of course, a lot of modern Christianity is all about the show, shows, entertainment come and see the signs and wonders come and see the spiritual gifts come and get words of knowledge get words of prophecy and it's all turning into fortune telling not what God is saying but what is the church going to tell you well of course this is a counterfeit religion but the real church is the body of Christ those who are born of Christ, born again, by full and genuine and permanent repentance, a permanent turning away from sins, to obey Jesus who says, not just to the woman caught in adultery, but to all of us, your sins are forgiven, go and sin no more. That's an attitude of your mind. Do you want to sin ever again? Well, the answer is no. But don't lie to God, because if you are using Jesus as a way of getting out of hell every time you sin, and your attitude to sin is to not hate sin, but you actually like sinning, which is to say you love sinning, and you use scripture to get out of your death sentence every time you sin, knowing that using scripture to manipulate the situation in your holy huddles let's keep forgiving each other and you're deluded 
you're deluded. Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, 1 John 3, Romans 6, 2 Peter 2, 20 to 22, is a holy hedge of scripture that surrounds us, the body of Christ, keeps us in because sin is always crouching at the door it wants to get in. But once your temple has been swept clean, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and you're full of the Holy Spirit on the inside of the temple, your spirit, then you know the words, your sins are forgiven, go and sin no more. Of course, we have the New Testament, the New Covenant, which explains our battle with this world, the spirits of this world, not against flesh and blood, but spirits of this world. And of course, the enemy is always trying to trip us up to make us go back to the life of sin. Now read the book of Romans. Romans 8, verse 1 forward, New King James Bible. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus those who do not live according to sinful nature but they do live according to the Holy Spirit so there it is the fruit of the Holy Spirit love joy peace patience goodness kindness gentleness perseverance long-suffering and self-control the culmination of the fruit Galatians 5 22 forward self-control it's for you, for me, to control our tongues. Now, I'm not going to go to it in detail. I might do another video shortly, maybe today, I don't know, about how to exercise spiritual gifts. Because once you're moving in the Holy Spirit, you see things beneath the surface that very few people see. And you get a word of knowledge, and then it's, what do I do with this? You take that thought captive, you ask Jesus inside your own head. You ask him, what do I do with this? And you wait until he tells you. Unless he tells you to give it out, you don't give it out. You hold on to that information. That is just for you to know. Words of prophecy, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, words of healing come to you in your mind from God because the Holy Spirit is in you. He's in your mind, he's in your spirit, your soul, and your body. Don't you know the temple for the Holy Spirit is your body? Spirit, soul, and body. So don't let sin into your body. Don't eat sin, so to speak. There are things not to eat anymore, things not to drink anymore, unless the Lord says, for me, no more alcohol. No more nicotine. Led by the Holy Spirit, not a religion. It isn't for us to start a religion based on our personal beliefs. Each of us must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And today, 3rd June, 2023, there are people not yet born again. Not yet babies in Christ, not yet on the milk. And there are many churchgoers not born again. They think they are with their minds. They feel they are, they are with their emotions. And that is some sort of soulish belief. But it's not spiritual. It's emotional. It's mental. It's intellectual. It's theological. We're not saved by the feelings we have towards God. We are saved because we humble ourselves to God, the uncreated creator, recognizing at one point in history, the father sent the only begotten son to die in my place for my sins. And when I see that for myself, by faith, it's revealed to me the truth. And I personalize it and think, yes, this is for me. And I want Jesus to be Lord, number one, of my life. King above all kings. Judge above all judges. Saviour above all saviours. Shepherd above all shepherds. Pastor 
above all pastors, teacher above all teachers, God above all gods with a small g. So I'm going to say it again, this is the post-denominational age, but they don't believe it. The denominational leaders do not believe it because they cannot see another way to, quote, do Christianity. So it will continue, the organizations will continue, but the real church, ecclesia of God, disciples of Jesus Christ, are the born again believers baptized with, in, through the Holy Spirit. So it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. And that's a, a general statement right there. As long as I keep my flesh, my sinful nature in check and make sure I'm not speaking, but Christ is speaking. Of course, I still have a free will. I still have a human voice. I can still give my opinions, but I'm going to make it very clear. This is my opinion, but the Lord is saying is something else. And I can't give you a definitive answer on every question because I'm not God. I'm not Father, I'm not Jesus, I'm not the Holy Spirit, I'm not Yahweh. No one is God except God. But we have the Holy Spirit of God. So if you want to know what God is saying, ask him. Jeremiah 33, 3. And whatever God tells you, tell us, because we too want to hear what God is saying because that is the nature of body ministry in the body of Christ. We're not the teachers, the Holy Spirit is. We're now in the prophetic age of the church, the body of Christ, the ecclesia of God, servants, disciples, and ambassadors for King Jesus. But can we go into the churches and tell them how to not run their church as a business? No. No, because their minds are made up. This is how they're going to do it. There's a career, they are the clergy, it's their job, and they're doing it for Jesus. They think. They think. Salvation is a gift from God. And once you're saved, you know that God is not your employer. You're not his employee. We are subjects of King Jesus, subject to the will of Christ, in the Holy Spirit, in the will of God the Father. So we're going to leave it there, and um, Trevor's going to join me now. He's been listening patiently there. Just, just step back, Trevor, by the tree in the background, and uh, Trevor's going to close in prayer. Okay, yeah. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you this day. We thank you for your word. Pray that your word goes forth and will fall into good ground. We pray that your word will bear fruit, good fruit, not like this ornamental pear tree that doesn't bear fruit. We pray, Lord, your word in our lives will bear good fruit. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen. So, brethren, off the one God, keep praying for us wherever you are. And we're praying for you because, like I've said before, if you're on your own, you're not on your own. Physically you are, but Christ is with you, of course. Be careful. Be shrewd as a serpent, gentle as the dove. Because the enemy wants to put you in situations which will... Uh, enable the enemy to take you to court so be very careful what you say out of your mouth remember uh, spiritual gifts are given for you to help you to understand what's going on but be led by the spirit and only give out what God has told you if he tells you to speak it out audibly so God bless you talk again by the grace of God God bless God bless God bless